Hi, everyone. This is the uh, Canadian Foreign Policy Hour, and I am Eve Ingler. Hi, everyone. This is a weekly yes. critical look at Canada's role abroad. Uh, we've been off uh, for about a month now uh, because of the holiday period, and then I was uh, in uh, Uganda and uh, and Kenya, which have uh, which are eight hours ahead uh, from Montreal, so uh, uh, very difficult to uh, to do it at two a.m. Uh, uh, first of all, I just want to thank uh, Bagwant and Wendy uh, for their um, uh, financial uh, uh, support; much appreciated. Um, so, just after Christmas, I went. Uh, to uh, Uganda, where uh, my partner uh, uh, is from. Her mom lives there with uh, uh, two kids. And uh, we traveled, we were supposed to travel uh, through the, uh, the U.S. Uh, to New York. And there was a, uh, about a 24-hour layover we were supposed to have, so we were supposed to be able to spend a day uh, in New York or part of a day in New York and, um, the customs, uh, not the customs, I guess the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, anyways, the, the, the U S you have to go to U S customs, I guess, on, uh, on Canada's uh, in Montreal. And, uh, I was actually blocked from going to the U S. So this flight that I had, was um was uh i was blocked from getting on it uh, uh new york montreal new york new york uh, i think it was doha doha uh, kampala and uh the agent the u.s agent that blocked me um from entering the u.s um he cited the fact that that I was uh, uh, found. Uh, he's excited that I had a I had a, a criminal record from two thousand seven, and I don't believe I actually have this. I, I'm. It's, it's all very weird. Um, I think it's possible. It's referring to putting up posters on then Foreign Affairs Minister Pierre Pettigrew's posters during the election, um, but. But I've been to the U.S. maybe eight or nine, I don't know, 10, six, I don't know exactly how many times since 2007. Uh, one time in 2010, I had a bit of difficulty uh, to go to Vermont to do an event at the University of Vermont. Um, but uh, ultimately, I actually was taken off the Greyhound bus, but ultimately they let me go. It was a fundraiser after the Haiti earthquake. Um, because I have been, I have been arrested. Of course, I don't believe I actually have a criminal record, um, but uh, and I have to get this checked out exactly what this claim. But the but the fact that they're pursuing this now made maybe you know makes me wonder why they're going, why they would stop me from going to the U.S. for something in two thousand seven. And the only thing I can presume is, is that um, I uh, I got. Uh, uh, detained for trying to disrupt the U.S. Uh, speech by the U.S. ambassador at the Queen Elizabeth about a year and a half ago. Long, complicated story, but I ended up with this one-year condition for this. For this, this I didn't even get in the room um, for this. This basically get this thing go away. With the, that year condition ended, and also we we disrupted uh, Secretary uh, Blinken, U.S. Secretary of State Blinken's event at the Jean Talon market about uh, maybe a year and a half ago, very, very successful. Uh, him and Melanie Jolie had to like basically beeline it. They came out to the public spot and we all started yelling about a series of things, most around Haiti, had to beeline it. Anyways, so the, the fact that this is like immediately when I went through the customs, they like a red flag came up right away. Um, and uh, I'm assuming it has to do with the U.S. ambassador thing and or the Secretary Blinken um, 
uh, incident, uh, and then they any criminal um, they that's enough. They can just you know they can just cite that there was something on my on my record, and that's justification to not allow me in. Anyways, I was blocked from entering the U.S., which was actually quite a mess because I ended up having to get a new ticket. Uh, ended up being um, uh, a fairly expensive uh, endeavor. Um, but it shows you, uh, uh, I'm presuming it's a response to these um, these disruptions of uh, U.S. officials. It could just be generally more because of you know disruptions in general or or getting a bit of a, a profile for different questions and and angering the Canadian uh, uh, powers that be and that trickling into the U.S. I don't know, but I presume it has to do with the Blinken or the U.S. ambassador uh, incident. Anyways, uh, on to more um, uh, political, directly political incidents of, of recent uh, days. Uh, there was a story that CBC published uh, maybe a week ago or so titled Canada Led Efforts to Weaken Original UN Indigenous Rights Declaration in the early 2000s, uh, showed from internal files, Australian files, that Canada and the US were working to sabotage the uh, uh, declaration all quietly in the background, not a huge surprise, but a confirmation of, of, what, of what they were doing. Another story, global male business story, uh, profile of his uh, business uh, leader, CEO, CFO, entitled Sun Life CFO Moves to Asia, a training ground for future CEOs at Canada's largest insurers. And what's interesting about this, from a foreign policy perspective, is they're basically saying these business, uh, the the hierarchy within the insurer company, insurance company, that Asia operations is really important. This isn't new. Canadian, and this gets, you know, we people talk, I think, a bit about Canadian banks, big players in the Caribbean more than a century ago, throughout uh, Latin America. Uh, but Canadian insurance companies have been been big players around the world in Asia, uh, in Latin America for more than a century, and that process actually still uh, uh, continues uh, as the story uh, uh, confirms. Um, the Calgary Flames NHL team had a, uh, a Canadian Forces Appreciation Night, which is common. Canadian, uh, the NHL teams, I think all or most of them have these military appreciation nights every year. And uh, they don't tend to have like, you know, uh, I don't know, nurses appreciation nights or uh, teachers appreciation nights. They do have military appreciation nights. And it's all part of this, you know, militarist um, kind of, public relations exercise that that different institutions lend themselves towards, but also the, the military really seeks out because they have the biggest uh, public relations apparatus of any institution in the country. And um, the, the, there was a story uh, uh, kind of confirming that uh, titled Department of National Defense wants to hire journalists for role play. And so D and D is hiring uh, former journalists uh, uh, to, I think, a thirty six months thirty six month contracts, so three year contracts to basically uh, train the military officials in uh, dealing with interviews and sort of asking tough questions and not to get too offended or you know whatever all the different techniques that would be uh, go into you know, dealing well with, uh, with the military. And this is all part of the hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of money, public money every year that goes into the PR apparatus of the Canadian military to make sure that they um, are able to promote their institution, first and foremost, but also promote uh, their worldview and um, and quite frankly, promote a, 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 a pro-Washington, pro-U.S. empire, pro-Canadian military uh, 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 worldview. The Green Party, as part of their um, New Year's, Green's New Year resolutions for the Liberal government, which they released a letter uh, just after um, 
I think January 4th. Uh, it says, quote, the Trudeau government must reiterate its unconditional support for Ukraine. With this in mind, sanctions against Russia must be taken seriously and efforts to halt Russian oil sales must be renewed, said Deputy Leader Jonathan uh, Pedno. So the Greens are really doubling down, continuing with this push on the proxy war, uh, basically demanding the Liberals uh, get tough or get tougher or stay tough or however you want to frame it exactly. Uh, but basically pressuring the liberals from a, a, a more uh, sort of uh, a belligerent uh, perspective. To me, this is total madness. Um, you know, I've said it over and over again. I don't agree with the Russian invasion, but this is a disaster for Ukraine. Clearly Russia's uh, advancing and doubling down on on more of the same is just guaranteeing that this war goes on forever and that more and more Ukrainians get killed. And that seems to be the position. There seems to be a, a very little willingness to kind of reflect on uh, what's brought us here uh, within the Green Party and, and, and elsewhere. I, in, unfortunately, it, it seems like it's the conservatives, the Polyevs, uh, conservatives that are the ones that are starting to like put up some uh, uh, question marks on all of this uh, on the NATO uh, uh, proxy war. The Maple, about uh, maybe 10 days ago, published a story titled a NATO Directorate Warned Azov Remained Fanatics uh, Recruits Acquired Canadian Made Rifles. And so some internal documents where the Canadian officials uh, were basically admitting internally that the, the uh, as one put it, it's true that Azov was brought into the National Guard of Ukraine, but they are fanatics. That's the Canadian official speaking internally uh, uh, that, uh, so on one hand, they were saying, well, Azov's been sort of denazified or it's you know no longer this crazy right wing force. It's now part of the National Guard. That's their kind of public relations. And then uh, privately, they were admitting that the they still are, you know, these sort of far right uh, 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 forces. There was a story about um, uh, Philippines, Canada, I defense pact, vow cooperation versus cyber threats. And so this is all part of um, the U.S., deepening ties, military ties specifically with Philippines as a counterweight to China. Philippines and China have fairly significant uh, territorial disputes, fishing rights, um, and Canada has been helping the Philippines on that front. And now it looks like they're trying to sign a defense pact. And, and um, obviously this is in a context of uh, contained China. And uh, as part of that, the uh, I think La Presse had a story about how um, Canada is trying to uh, uh, integrate into part of the AUKUS, the U.S., Australia, British uh, alliance that's principally about building nuclear submarines, but but is really about sort of orienting China or uh, Australia more aggressively in towards an anti. China uh, uh, posture, and Canada wants to join in the AUKUS uh, uh, from a, an intelligence uh, uh, standpoint, according to the story. Um, there was uh, a couple stories in the French media, uh, one from the Journal de Montréal, it was very odd, it says, uh, uh, pas d'audition par crainte de représailles de la Chine. So it's saying this is play, uh, that's about the Tiananmen Square massacre, and it's claiming that that uh, actors of Chinese descent are not interested in in um, in auditioning for this play because they're scared of 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 uh, of uh, the you know the reaction from China. Um, I have a hard time believing it. I I don't know, uh, uh, but that's um, that's what's being claimed in the Journal de Montréal. There's another story um, saying that the absent um, the absence of a of a foreign register agency um, 
is undermining the uh, police targeting of these community centers in uh, Chinese community centers in uh, in the in Montreal and just by Chinatown, and then one out in the suburbs here in Montreal. Um, and so, and then saying the government has admitted that. Uh, so this is how, because they, they haven't provided any evidence about these targeting of these uh, Chinese uh, community centers that they they're supposed they were the claim was that they were they were Chinese police stations uh, and the community center one community center I went to the press conference about a month ago now uh, a bit more than that uh, was uh, saying they're basically going to sue I don't know where that's at now um, the suing the the uh, RCMP for defamation for for uh, claiming that they uh, are this uh, Chinese police. Um, a center, even though nothing has been, no evidence been provided, it's caused all kinds of problems. Banks refusing to, to uh, the loan, and they look like they're going to lose their 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 or their uh, space, their building because of these uh, the financial repercussions, lost public money. It's just a a total disaster, and yet nothing has been, no evidence has been presented, uh, but they have been sort of defamed in the public domain, and the police are now saying, or the the government and police are. Are, are partly uh, trying to pa- pass this off on that there's lack of a, a foreign ed- reg- agent, foreign uh, registry agent uh, uh, process, which they're of course uh, uh, pushing. Um, there was a protest, uh, I guess maybe two weeks ago or something like that in, uh, in front of foreign minister, uh, Melanie Jolie's uh, uh, house here in Montreal. I wasn't, I wasn't in town, so I didn't. I didn't attend. Um, it led to a huge reaction, huge backlash. Um, what was interesting about it, in part, was how aggressive the NDP MPs were in denouncing this protest, and basically, this real mor- moralizing. How dare you know? Protest at our offices, protest at uh, uh, Parliament Hill, but how dare you protest at, at her house? And that that you know, sort of on the surface of it, that sounds all fine and good, um, except that there's been lots of protests at at politicians' houses. Uh, Steve Engelbo, the minister, he was involved in a very high profile protest at Ralph Klein, then Alberta Premier, in 2002, putting up uh, solar panels in his house, on the roof of his house. Uh, this pro Greenpeace protest at Trudeau's house, 2012, and the student strike in Quebec. I was part of one protest, night protest that tried to. We marched right up to Jean Charest's house in Westmount. I know there was other uh, demonstrations during the student strike that went to Charest's house. Uh, there's been uh, multiple protests at um, different politicians' houses in in recent years. Ontario. Uh, minister two years ago, uh, a couple other examples that I that I came up with. Um, so this 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 moralizing against this is is quite quite um, uh, quite a thing. And and in fact, in the U.S., in recent weeks, there's been protests at uh, Blinken's house, at the the uh, the house of uh, the uh, the defense minister, not defense minister, whatever they call it, in the states. Um, there's been uh, at, at Schumer at Chuck Schumer, the head of the Senate's house in New York. So there's been all these protests at politicians' houses, and yet the NDP uh, Heather McPherson, the foreign critic, put out two different tweets, a really over the top condemnation of these protests, like more stronger language than any, any condemnation of Israel's genocide, right? Um, and uh, uh, it's just part of this whole this 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 the the apartheid the genocide lobby just whipping up uh, hysteria after after every different type of protest they come up with some new angle um, you know when there was the protests at the uh, at the mall the Eaton Center the, all this condemnation and condemned you know restaurant workers for for clapping when protests came by they condemned protests at university campuses. I mean, it's just like an endless stream. Every different type of protest is illegitimate, according to the apartheid lobby um, and the NDP MPs joining in on it, which they did, a bunch of them, um, on this this Jolie's House protest. 
was just uh, just echoing that uh, angle. And that gets to this 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 the fascism of of uh, of the Zionist uh, movement in Canada. And, and really, I think it's quite clear the Zionist movement is right at the forefront of of uh, fascistic direction within Canadian politics. And there was a uh, op-ed by the head of uh, B'nai B'rith and the head of the Canadian Police Association, maybe two or three weeks ago now, where they basically just, just call for more hammering of protests. They cite the the success of the the, the G20 protest, the G20 repression in Toronto in 2010. That was like the, the police had to pay out like 16 million bucks for for just like completely violating protesters' rights. There was the kettling where they all these random people that went out to the pharmacy in the evening and got kettled for hours and hours. I mean, it was just like an example of exactly what the police shouldn't be doing. But they're they're citing this as is great example, also repression of Wet'suwet'en protests. And so you have Zionist uh, organizations really aligning with the, I would call it the more traditional fascistic force, which I think the police have often been, and um, and uh, and promoting this kind of vision. And to the point where you have uh, Sija a couple of days ago, the Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs, actually putting out a a uh, a tweet um uh calling on uh, people to uh uh protest or calling on uh, uh their their members to support a um a, the uh to fight back against police cuts in Toronto so Sija is like calling for increasing the police budget so this is both the advocacy agent of the uh Jewish federations uh, across the country is taking up the cause of let's increase the the police budget, which is part of this whole uh, clamping down on um, on uh, on protesters. Sorry, I've actually just misplaced a, a something. I'll be back in ten seconds. Sorry about that. Um, and so, so this we're seeing this the uh, uh, sort of um, alignment of the uh, Zionist fascistic forces. As part of this, they, they got to the point, and they got the Toronto Police to to shut down, to criminalize these protests taking place on top of the 401 uh, highway in Toronto. Um, and they're basically saying you can't protest in in uh, neighborhoods that they define as as uh heavily jewish now the 401 <laughs> i don't i don't know the geography of this place exactly where they got to shut down but it's on top of the highway one of the bigger highways and maybe the biggest highway even in the country it's it's you know a very small proportion of the cars going by would be uh would be driven by 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 jewish people um, but they whipped up a huge storm of all these protests in in uh, in Jewish neighborhood, and this is Yara Sachs, who's a, a a minister. I think she's the health minister in the Trudeau government, the MP in that or in that around this area in Toronto. She says she posted on Twitter, as I stated last week, and we'll repeat again: protests within largely Jewish neighborhoods, like the one like the ones in our riding of York Center, is completely unacceptable. Targeting an overpass in an area that is known to be local Jewish community is a form of intimidation. Um, now, I mean, standing in front of a synagogue and protesting is, of course, which would be, you know, a directly Jewish uh, institution, is a completely legitimate form of protest. Uh, you, you, you mean, people have the right to protest. It's very, quite a um, the charter gives us pretty broad uh, rights around around protesting. It's certainly <laughs> protesting on an overpass highway of one of the bigger highways in the country is not some sort of illegitimate intimidation of of uh, of of the Jewish community. But this is the minister in the government, and it, what it led to was the police arresting people for for holding up placards on top of this major uh, overpass and. 
as a story that uh, uh, Judy Haven published, I just read today, got titled, um, I think it was published by this, uh, the register, the socialist register, it's entitled Gaza protests in Toronto, marching orders for the police. Um, and basically they were able to get this, this, uh, uh, get the police, a soul freak out, get the police to shut this down, arrest people and, um, and say that, you know, if some person defines some neighborhood somewhere as heavily or predominantly Jewish, therefore you don't have uh, the right to protest, uh, presumably in, in the whole neighborhood, because an overpass, I mean, if you can't, if you can't protest an overpass, you're certainly not allowed to protest in front of a synagogue. You're certainly not allowed to protest in front of a, I don't know, a Jewish community center. You're certainly not allowed to protest in front of a, of a, a Jewish day school. You're certainly not allowed to protest in front of uh I, you know, I don't know, so one of the charities, a uh, couple hundred Canadian charities that raise funds for projects in Israel. Uh, um, so it's a pretty remarkable um, uh, uh, attack against fundamental rights, uh, but it's um, it's taking place and it's uh, it seems to have, seems to have been, at least in the, in the surface of it, uh, uh, successful. As part of this kind of like over the top uh, uh, attack against all kinds of you know, democratic kind of um, uh, institutions. There's big lawsuits taking place at all these universities. So McMaster is being sued and student union uh, by these Zionist groups. There's a story about the uh, at Concordia, same thing happening. And in this story, they're calling on the university to stop funding the Concordia Student Union and to dismantle solidarity for Palestinian human rights. So they're just openly, there's just no, no, like no bones about it. You should just not allow, not fund, you know, the 40,000 or whatever it is, undergraduates at Concordia, they shouldn't have the right to have a student union. That's essentially what they're saying, because a handful of Jewish students are claiming they felt, felt uncomfortable on campus. It's, it's just like open, just, you know, the decades and decades of of um of struggle for you know representation of students on university campuses there's a whole democratic structure thousands of students vote every year um in quebec it's actually you know these the the the, the funding to the university students is, is all governed uh uh by by provincial law they, they i mean they can't they can't cut the funding uh, but these but these Zionist groups are calling for it and just openly they don't they don't know bones about it. A couple of Jewish students felt uncomfortable with something or other and you know defund the whole student union, dismantle uh, 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 student group, uh, etc. So this is this is uh, this is where we're at on some of this stuff and it's just example ex after example. Now now in terms of the fascist element um, on uh, some of this, I did a piece a couple of weeks ago in that. Part of the the whole like freak out of these of these pro Israel groups, they did the whole big thing about the Eaton Center, right? This this is maybe a month ago now, right around Christmas. Uh, they they had a big freak out about a guy who's claimed to have said, uh, I think he did say, uh, "I'll put you six feet under." He's masked and actually just apparently they they're there's a uh, arrest. He's just been arrested uh, yesterday. Or there was just an announcement about it. Huge freak out about it. Now, the source, what, what's partly what's interesting in some of this stuff, and it, when you actually learn about what happened, there was some guy who, who was really provocative, and they were basically, you know, two guys being macho and back and forth, and only one bit was, you know, uh, on, on video, and they made a huge freak out about it. Um, but but, um, but when, when um, one of the things that's interesting about it is that the source of all this Okay, the video that like millions of people, all the right wing media globe, the, talking about it. The source of this video is Mayor Weinstein. Well, in fact, the source of the video was this was this uh, Hindu uh, Hindu nationalist who's who's uh, cl close with the uh, Mayor Weinstein and the and the JDL. But one of the things you're seeing happening, and a bunch of the stuff on the on the on the overpass protests, the JDL. It's Mayor Weinstein. JDL doesn't technically exist anymore. But Mayor Weinstein, who was the former head for years and years, maybe decades even, um, is is the is the player on this. The 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 even like the minister, even um, Mendicino, the Liberal MP, is like quote tweeting Mayor Weinstein. Well, Mayor Weinstein, like 
JDL was banned in the U.S. and they, I mean, they got a whole like they, they you know, they were they were investigated by Canadian police for planning to bomb Palestine House a decade ago. They were a couple of the JDL guys, uh, Canada guys, were down at the APEC uh, five years ago, and they beat up they beat up this older Palestinian guy, put him in the hospital, and they beat up this younger uh, a Jewish uh, uh, you know critic of Israel. Um, uh, they got a whole long list of, 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 you know, threatening and violent behavior. I, myself, they, you know, they busted my, uh, bike and they stole my lock and the guy spat on me anyways. Although, you know, I've, I've had my own run-ins with the, with the JDL guys. Um, but so there, the, what's happening is part of the, the, the sort of, uh, because the protests against the genocide are so big and so sustained, is that the the Israel lobby and and even you know liberal MPs are going like closer and closer to these like openly fascist elements of of the Jewish community, like Mayor Weinstein being the preeminent uh, uh, a figure. Um, uh, so that's you know as part of the dynamic that's that's playing out. That's kind of kind of interesting. And as uh, Mahar Arar pointed out on uh on twitter uh yesterday or day before he said us uk canada governments have deployed policing and intelligence agencies to suppress and spy on the voices that are opposing genocide and those and those who should be saying but those who travel to join the criminal idf are being offered free tickets and the, and when they're back no questions asked unbelievable so all this effort by the you know security intelligence agencies targeting uh, the pro-Palestinian or anti-genocide uh, protesters, but but there's like almost no investigation or no announced investigation of all these Canadians who openly are fighting in Gaza, right? I mean, anyone basically fighting in Gaza is committing war crimes. I mean, how like with look what Israel's done you know, the IDF's done, it's just almost impossible to imagine that these people weren't engaged in war crimes. And there's all these stories of these individuals naming themselves being in Gaza. There's these like Canadian Jewish News published story about about uh, uh, a, a, a group chat of these parents, you know, of these Canadian genocidaires. That's what we should call them. They're Canadian genocidaires. Um, uh, and, and, you know, Canada has legislation around universal jurisdiction and around committing war crimes abroad and that being, you know, violation of Canadian law. They have a unit. They have a whole unit of RCMP and uh, Minister of Justice uh, that's supposed to look into these things. Uh, there's no evidence that any of this is happening. There's no comment from Canadian Justice Minister saying, you know, people who, who are going and killing Palestinians in Gaza that have Canadian passports that they might want to, you know, um, uh, we might be investigating them or they, they might want to be careful that they're following international law or whatever, whatever. Um, CJPME, Canadians for Justice and Peace in the Me Middle East, sent out a, a le sent a letter to uh, a Justice Minister um, Arif, I believe uh, is, his, is his name, and um, about this and about listing a series of things that they should do to curtail Canadian uh, uh, genocidaire. And um, there's been, I'm doing a piece I'm going to publish in the next couple of days uh, on this. And there's campaigns in, in a number of the European countries. There's a group called the March 30 Movement uh, in Belgium and Netherlands who've launched uh, criminal prosecutions against at least one uh, Dutch uh, Israeli for war crimes and genocide in Gaza. Uh, he's in the, fighting in the Israeli military. And there's a French uh, member of parliament that has done something similar to CJPME, asked the, the French justice ministry to investigate the French who are fighting. Um, there's some uh, a series of other kind of initiatives like that taking place in, in other countries. And certainly that should happen here, right? We don't know how many, but dozens certainly maybe over the years, the estimates have varied from about 230 to, to 78 of Canadians in the Israeli military. And um, and uh, uh, so there are many that are definitely fighting and they should be pursued. They should be, we, got, we need to get their names, first of all, 
and we need to begin the process of pressuring um, uh, the justice minister to to look into it. But also, I think I don't I don't know the legal thing that well. But I think there's some avenues for lawyers to to launch uh, like a private prosecution type initiative uh, about these uh, individuals uh, uh, killing Palestinians. On the legal front, and I think what would reinforce some of these efforts is things like the International uh, Court, Court of Justice uh, ruling in favor of South Africa's uh, uh, case saying that Israel's in violation of the Genocide Convention. Uh, obviously, we just saw that uh, Mexico and Chile brought a brought uh, Israel to the International Criminal Court, a, you know, a different court. Uh, those kind of, I think, successes on those fronts would strengthen the hand, would bolster the ability to pursue individual Canadians for war crimes and genocide. And um, <clears throat> the the Canadian position, or the, everything that happened around the International Court of Justice case, was quite fascinating. We were successful. We were very successful in forcing and pressuring the NDP uh, to come out and and pressure the Liberals to not attack uh, South Africa's case, as they they've done uh, other International Court of uh, Justice (ICJ). Uh, and ICC endeavors in the past. And um, the Green Party came out in favor. The NDP position is not quite as good, but but it was, uh, I think, pretty good. Uh, uh, re re repeatedly referred to genocide. And um, and what the what the liberals have done is quite interesting. They I would say, considering how terrible they are on on the issue, we, I think probably about as good as we could have expected. Uh, obviously, that's not acceptable, but you know, <laughs> politics are what they are at the at this current moment. And they basically waffled. They waited to the last minute to put out a statement, and then they said this business about uh, they support the court, but they they don't support the premise of the case. And then that was sort of taken as criticism. And then they came out with a statement, uh, uh, kind of walking that back a bit, being a bit more kind of neutral in their language. And I was just watching a video of Melanie Jolie being asked about uh, the Kenneth's position of ICJ. And she just won't answer it. She just says, you know, I put out a statement, read my statement. And the statement's bad. Again, like I'm not, it's bad. Uh, but considering how bad they've been and how much they've enabled the genocide, I would say it's about... Um, you know, is less bad as we could have we could have expected uh, realistically. So that was some, this was, I think, important campaigning that happened on that. And we'll see what happens with the actual ruling. Uh, but it's it's clearly already uh, uh, really ratcheted up the pressure. You know, all these Israel, the media is like full of all these stories by the by the uh, Israel lobby people uh, saying, no, this is outrageous, the genocide. Whatever. To me, like once you're arguing, once you're, you're writing op-ed saying no, it's not a genocide, you've kind of lost, a, you know, a bit of the 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 PR battle because that's you're 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 just operating in terrain. It's like saying no, no, I'm not a pedophile. You know, like it, you're you're operating in terrain that is 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 very difficult. Most people just get you know you hear genocide Israel, genocide Israel, genocide Israel. Um, I think that's uh, that's serious uh, damage to to Israel's uh, reputation, but of course, you know it, it doesn't stop in that much in the short term. But but I think it's uh, definitely um, um, a good a, a, you know step in the in the right direction. Now, um, I probably should should jump through a few thing, few things here, but um, uh, it is still unbelievable I, I, at this point is that on the eve of the case uh, against Israel's uh, genocide, Trudeau um, met with members of the Jewish community in Toronto and posted saying to the members of the Jewish community, uh, I want you to know that our commitment to you and to Israel as a Jewish and dem democratic state is unwavering. So this is on the eve of a genocide case. Now we're at 30,000. Palestinians killed, 25,000 confirmed, 8,000 under the rubble, two-thirds are, are uh, women and children, and, uh, and still talking about unwavering support. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty unbelievable to see this. Um, 
they I pu I pu published a piece uh, on my site a couple of days ago about basically some of the attacks that I've been facing. Uh, I got uh, being accused of being an anti-Semite. I, I had some I had an event in Ottawa I did a few weeks ago, six weeks ago or so. Uh, there was people within the Independent Jewish Voices uh, milieu. I'm not really sure who it was. Um, who who tried to get the event? Go try to get me canceled from the event. It was an event about Canada, Canada, Israel, uh, uh, um, and 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 I so I did a piece, you know, sort of going going at this and kind of like delving into some of the elements of this. And the to me, it's unbelievable to see that the horrors that Israel's committing, and the mobilization of of uh, of claims of anti-Semitism are are you know central to justifying all this, right? If you look at if you look at the Canadian government's statement about the about the uh, the um, the ICJ case from South Africa, they literally they literally have a sentence in there saying I, it's too bad I didn't uh, actually uh, uh, print it out, but but saying that that. Um, the, you got to make sure that this case doesn't have effect on Jewish communities and their businesses and 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 their feelings and the community centers and something like that. Okay, so we're basically saying, you know, we're 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 not we're we're objecting to this South African case against genocide because there might be some uh, effect on Canadian Jewish community, right? The 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 counterposing of opposing genocide. With Canadian Jews and like the feelings or the or the perceived or or or, or real acts of 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 um, of uh, uh, you know hate or or whatever um, the counterposing it just absolutely directly. So in the story, you know, I I kind of and these leftists, just leftists who who you know who, who take this stuff up. And you know, I I I get I get you know we when you're operating in political world, right? You 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 have to live with the reality. So. We all are going to, in some way or another, um, uh, accept imperialistic, nationalistic, supremacist ideas, right? You, you, if you're operating in the real world, that's just you. You know, you got to make little gains, and you try to push forward gains. And 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 the reality is, it was so nationalistic, and so imperialistic, and so supremacist. Our ideology you have to accept it. You have to. You have to. You have to uh, concede to some of that ideology. Now, when you have left self-declared leftists. Who are who are explicitly enforcing those those ideologies? That's you know major step too far, and and that's what that's what uh, uh, they're doing in in, in this case vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, me. But but so I but in the piece I kind of I kind of you know say like well even if you accepted all of the claims all of the claims of the apartheid lobby. Around the huge rise of anti-Semitism that happened over the past three months, and you accept all of this stuff, it's still irrelevant in the scope of what we're talking about. Like I say, like I basically irrelevant. We're talking about thirty thousand people killed. We're talking about five hundred thousand people at risk of famine. We're talking about two million people displaced. 60,000 plus seriously injured, whatever. As I point out in the piece, if you believed, which I believe, that if Canada really came out hard against this, it would have an impact of at least 1% in curtailing Israel's barbarity. 1%. And I believe that that would be, if Canada came out strong against the genocide, that would have at least 1%. That would be 300 people not killed. That would be 5,000 people not fa facing famine. That would be 20,000 people not being driven from their home. I mean, there's no, like, if you accept, again, if you accept all of the, the, the claims of anti-Semitism, nothing, it's not even, it's not even, it, it's irrelevant compared to that, right? So, so the fact that leftists, despite the level of horror that Israel is committing and Canada's enabling, are still stuck on this like panic about like 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 Jewish feelings. I mean, quite, let's be honest, mostly about Jewish fucking feelings in Canada, right? Despite the horror, it's it's just it's 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 I find it just mind boggling to see 
uh, self-declared leftist being so, so anti-internationalist, so uh, imperialistic, and quite frankly, so supremacist in whose lives are valued. Um, so that's, uh, people can check out that article where I break some of that down. Now, uh, I've gone on too long here, but I do want to talk about what was going to be the uh, uh, major theme in, in this, or I think that just is just wild to see where all this is going. So, of course, the Canadian government um, has enabled uh, Israel's genocidal uh, policies, and and it's there is a force. There are there are forces trying to stop this, as some people have pointed out. They you know responsibility to protect, right? The the self the Canadian government's uh, 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 doctrine that they're pushing, uh, that, that you, you know, well, they're actually according to the genocide convention, uh, governments have the responsibility to intervene, to stop genocides and whatever you want to say about many elements of their ideology. And uh, there's lots to disagree with in their ideology. The, uh, Houthis, basically the Yemeni, de facto Yemeni government, has actually taken this responsibility somewhat seriously. And they've responded to Israel's onslaught by uh, trying to pressure Israel to stop by doing one thing they have power over, which is uh, uh, undermining or blocking Isra Israeli ships or Israel-linked Israel ships or bringing goods to Israel. And... The Canadian and U.S. governments, British governments, who are supporting the genocide, instead of saying, hey, Israel, stop this killing, and the Houthis have been clear that if the, if the killing is stopped, if, the, if, if humanitarian aid can go in, um, they'll stop targeting Israeli ships. But instead, the enablers of the genocide are saying, no, we, how, this is outrageous to put pressure on Israel to stop and so we're going to start bombing Yemen. And Israel, or so the U.S. and, and U.K. have bombed Yemen now but I think seven times in the past couple of weeks. And uh, this is escalating. And Canada, of course, a month ago joined the, uh, the uh, operation uh, protect, is a protective guardian or is a protective shield. I forget that. Um, and then Canada was one of the five countries listed by I think it's 10 countries that are part of this uh, initiative, only a couple Canadian uh, 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 troops helping coordinate this. And then Canada was one of the five countries listed with the US and British strikes uh, uh, on Yemen. And, um, and this, is just, this is just escalating, right? We're just seeing, you know, we see Israel bombed, uh, killed, I think five uh, uh, Iranian uh, Revolutionary Guard people in, in Damascus yesterday or the day before. And there's been obviously these bombings, uh, Hamas official in in uh, in Beirut a little a few weeks ago, and uh, we have obviously kind of a low level war going on in Lebanon. Uh, we have um, uh, Iraqi forces uh, attacking uh, U.S. facilities in in Iraq. I think they're saying 140 over the past three months. 140. Uh, uh, bombings apparently a, a number of u.s soldiers have been seriously injured no one's been killed there's a story where the the, the, the biden administration is saying that if one of these soldiers which is mostly based upon luck um uh, or you know a little bit better uh, targeting by the iraqi uh, forces if they kill an american soldier that might change the calculation and then it looks like the americans are sort of suggesting that they may then bomb iran but this is what's going on, right? We've got all these little factors going on that are leading us towards, you know, what's happening in Gaza is absolutely horrific. And, and uh, but, you know, extending that even further to, to you know, greater war uh, would be, you know, even more, <laughs> even worse. Um, but this is, this is what's going on. And the Canadian government is not, you know, working to stop the, central source of the problem, which is Israel's policy in Gaza. Uh, instead, it's just escalating. You know, it's talking about designated the Iranian uh, Revolution of Guard as a terrorist organization. Looks like that's happening. There's going to be it's gonna have all kinds of spillover effect because there's thousands, apparently there's 10,000 Iranian Canadians that have been in the, the Revolution of Guard. 
So that could cause total disaster for, for them. There's, there's um, hu huge numbers of Iranian. They're just, they're just, um, they are, um, they're forced to join the, the Revolutionary Guard. Uh, I guess young men, I don't know what the exact process is in Iran. Um, so, so the huge impl implications, you have um, the head of the conservatives putting out a statement saying Trudeau must stand with our allies by designating, designating the Houthis as terrorists, right? So doubling down on, we got basically want more war. That's, you know, the U S has been bombing Yemen, uh, been kind of at war with the Houthis for, for years now. Uh, and this is, you know, doubling down on that. The Americans look like they're going to, I don't know if they've done it or they're just about to do it. Uh, we list the Houthis as terrorist organizations, and now the Conservatives want Canada to do that. Um, so this is this is this is uh, dangerous stuff. Uh, it's escalating, and Canada has has basically just uh, played its part in supporting Israel, supporting the U.S. Uh, no matter where this looks like it's going, fortunately. We still, you know, uh, yesterday here in Montreal, on Saturday there was a car protest against the, the Canada's enabling genocide in Gaza. Yesterday there was at least a thousand people that marched. Today, uh, and I know it was bigger, it looked like very big protests in Toronto. Um, very cold here uh, yesterday. And uh, today, maybe two dozen uh, showed up. There's a the liberal retreat. Uh, we found out about it last minute. Um, the cabinet retreat protest. Um, so the, the movement now, it's more than three months and there's this still this huge protest across the country against Canada's role uh, in, in enabling the genocide. Um, obviously it hasn't been big enough to, to, to really force a, a serious shift. Uh, I think if the ICJ, um, comes down with a provisional ruling calling on Israel to uh, stop its slaughter. That would go some ways in, in um, uh, pushing the liberal government towards a, a less horrendous position. Um, I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. And uh, if people have comments and questions, I see uh, uh, Elizabeth can go ahead and I'll look if, uh, I'm not sure if Laura's here. Um, I will look for Laura to uh, to moderate. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Yeah, thank you. I'll just be quick, but I just had some comments because I've been a lot of that stuff you were talking about. <clears throat> for one thing, Israel always has to play the victim. He, they are very narcissistic. Besides you, all that other stuff, but um, <clears throat> and and the fact that the Zionists have anything to say in Canada is beyond me. You don't hear the Communist Party or the Socialist Party out there yapping their gums all the time. And that people would even give them the time of day, but that's what news is, I guess. But I think Canada is its leaders, all of them, uh, especially Trudeau. ICC is looking at charging because um, we're we're not being left out in the conversation anymore. Canada, U.S., Britain, and the EU, their leaders are being looked to be charged with abetting this genocide, and it's. It's only a matter of time because they have encouraged it to go on. They haven't did anything to say, this is horrific. We, we must do something. And so the, they, they can just be as stupid as they want because they all deserve to be put in a dungeon, in, you know, 50 feet below seawater because they're, they're criminal, every single one of them. And that's across the board, all those countries, except the ones that have stepped up to the plate. And I think Norway, I, I'm not sure, but Norway was one that did. And um and uh um and and the fact that um people that are Christians in this country, you know, like they just say, well, it, it, that's you know, they're they are supposed to have a state. Well, they're not. <laughs> not even if you even if you were an atheist, they're not, because it, they are they were told it's in the Old Testament that they would never have a state. They'd be wanderers their whole life. So the whole thing is 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 laughable if it wasn't so heart wrenching. And um, as far as Yemen, Yemen has not killed one person. And this was the latest uh, I heard today. And they're uh, making the ships go away. 
but they haven't hurt, killed anybody. But already the United States is killing Yemenis. And that in itself tells you everything. This is a plan. This is like, this is just like you're reading a book watching it. And so um, they, they don't want, nobody wants to stop killing Palestinians. I mean, they don't care, you know, so, um, you know, and this thing that's really come out is Harper, while he was prime minister, was setting up an Israeli business in Israel. So he was running our country and doing that. And that has come out and you like people are stunned. Nothing's being said. So it's all going to come down. So the Canadian people who really care like yourself and the, everybody here, we better be prepared and um, just start writing terrible letters to everybody, you know, in that's in those positions, because they're going to go. I mean, this is going to cost them for sure. Yeah, well, I mean, there is an effort, uh, Shane Martinez, uh, and I know he's got there's a development coming on that front uh, that six weeks ago or whatever that was now um, about bringing uh, uh, four Canadian ministers uh, legally responsible for complicity with war crimes, Trudeau, Jolie, Justice Minister, and um, the Revenue Minister. Um, so, so there is efforts and I know there's efforts in other countries, uh, similarly, um, I don't know, you know, how much traction that will have legally. I think we're going to need to have, uh, even if the legal cases, um, you know, if there is a basis, uh, legally, you know, politics enter the fray, of course. And, uh, so we're probably going to need to, uh, to change the, uh, the regime, uh, in this country and other countries, um, you know, in a sort of revolutionary way, uh, before having seeing Trudeau uh, in the dock, but uh, but uh, uh, certainly there is um, there are some efforts, and I know certainly Israeli officials are going to have uh, uh, difficulty uh, traveling traveling the world in uh, coming coming years. Uh, go ahead, Yuri. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, perfect. Okay. Well, first off, uh, Eve, welcome back. It's great to uh, have you back. And despite uh, despite harassment, I hope you were able to still enjoy the Christmas holidays in Uganda <laughs> and in Kenya. I uh, three quick questions. Uh, number one, uh, you know, continuing on with uh, with the big topic of the day, which is Israel. Uh, I I have to ask. What was the mood and perception in Uganda of South of uh, South Africa taking Israel to court and them doing their you know jacques uh, Israel of uh, genocide in Gaza and the occupied territories and are Ugandans and 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 other and other Africans you met aware of Israel's uh, imperialism in the continent as well as 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 well as becoming more aware of what. Canada, uh, you know, of, of, of Canadian imperialism. And do you have any updates on what's going on in in uh, in Congo, Congo Zaire, Congo DRC, and the recent elections there? And your th thoughts on the sad passing of uh, of uh, John Pilger and any thoughts on his uh, legacy that you that, that, that you'd like to share? Thanks. Yeah, I, I mean, I didn't I didn't uh, I didn't like have a conversations with people on the street about uh, Israel's genocide uh everyone in in uh in Bianca's family it, it's just like take it for granted that what Israel's doing is horrible that's not like right so uh and that spans different political kind of uh, views i think that's basically the the opinion of 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 most people in in, in Uganda, like it, I, I read the uh, East African uh, paper, which is uh, is basically an elite paper uh, for Kenya, Tanzania, and, and Uganda, uh, kind of a business oriented paper. Maybe I don't know, sort of like the Financial Times or the Wall Street Journal for for the region. And uh, they, you know, they write multiple uh, commentaries that are just slamming what Israel is doing it's not so it's not like it's very different from the media here right it's just like understood that this is just horrible and that Israel is 
colonialist kind of force. Um, and I think that's the opinion of, of, uh, of most people who are paying attention to, to world affairs, uh, from, from, uh, in those countries it's it's really it's a, it's a select few places in the world that don't don't like see what's actually happening right <laughs> which is which is you know the canada the us britain few european countries um you know even i think you know latin america as well um i don't have any uh, particular updates around uh uh you know recent elections in in congo um yeah john pilger was you know a very uh a very uh, important uh, uh, progressive journalist who, you know, decades and decades, um, uh, while, you know, many people kind of in his domain would over time went towards more and more kind of liberal uh, outlook. He, he accepted that, uh, you know, as part of wanting to, you know, be and stay in the establishment media, he accepted that, uh, that he's you know stuck with principles and and was accepted that the Glo the the, the Globe Mail certainly but even you know the Guardian wouldn't publish him anymore because uh, because he didn't go along with uh, NATO proxy war or, you know war on China etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, uh, so it's obviously it's a uh, it's a uh, a big loss in terms of uh, uh, left wing. Um, uh, inter international affairs uh, media. Uh, go ahead, uh, Jake. Yes, uh, uh, you made a reference in regard to the protest overpass that 401. It was overpass on the 401 and Avenue Road because what happened with the genocide things and so on, now there are different protests in different locations, which usually they were downtown. And uh, in the last one, which was about, uh, I think last Saturday, they, or the Saturday before that, the police arrested three people, pro-Palestinians, and Nebirith is charging them, of course. Never uh, just charging anybody and everybody to harass you and to destroy you financially, but it's horrendous that the police really got on them because the Jews did not feel comfortable, and there were anti-Semitic things were said that which actually absolutely untrue because I was a week before that myself there, the pro-Palestinians were on one side of the sidewalk, the other. Uh, Jewish uh, people with the flags were on the other side, and there were about 50 cops in between. There was nothing anti-Semitic, which never is. And there are about three lawyers, I think, now defending the, the Palestinian lawyers, I think, because they contacted me if I want to be a witness to testify that there's no anti-Semitism in those things, which, of course, I said, yes, my, my, I myself had a big science says Israel is a terrorist state, and that was fine. So, you know, this, this is ridiculous, ridiculous, how everybody's calling down to the Jewish lobby and Jewish uncomfortness, you know. So just wanted to say that. Go ahead, John. Uh, hey, welcome back, Yves. Felicitations pour les vacances. Uh, it came to my attention late, and I'm just wondering what uh, in the Jer Jerusalem Declaration on Anti-Semitism, which was the middle of last year when that came out and has garnered a few. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just uh, it seems to have garnered quite a few academic signatures. Is it gaining any traction anywhere that you can see outside of academia? Um, I haven't seen that much. Uh, it was uh, obviously sort of being uh, counterposed to the the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliances, the IHRA's anti-Palestinian um, uh, definition of anti-Semitism. <clears throat> um, so, but I, I haven't seen it uh, get that much uh, that much traction. Uh, personally, I think it's like I I agree with it. 
as a way to undercut the IHRA, but the whole thing, the whole exercise should just be, you know, ignored and dropped, right? Like there's, there's no need for um, the city of Richmond uh, to adopt a definition about anti -Sem I mean, it's all just like a, a Zionist kind of yeah. hysteria creation as a way to, you know, intimidate and to whatever, right? It so. It, it's a good thing to have in your back pocket if you're in an organization or a community that starts talking about the IRHA declaration. Yeah. yeah. Thank I you. Yeah. Go ahead, Laurel. Yeah, I don't want to give an excuse um, to Trudeau, but if he is coming out on the side of um, Jewish people's concern about feeling threatened by pro-Palestinian protesters, it could be because he's hearing from them that they are lobbying him. They are, they are flooding his office with emails and with phone calls or maybe even going up to Ottawa and talking to him. I don't know. But anyway, there, there is such a thing as lobbying and, and they're very good at it, the, some of those groups. What I'm wondering is maybe maybe the reason why he's taking their side, and I don't think that he's completely innocent on this, but maybe the reason why he's taking their side is because he's hearing from them, but he's not hearing from the rest of us. I mean, I know that CJPME have, has a full-time lobbyist now, Michael Bookard, I think his name is, but I'm wondering if, if uh, Just Peace Advocates lobbies Trudeau, if World Beyond War lobbies Pr Trudeau or Melanie Jolie, I mean, are those are peace groups getting appointments with with the two of them and and haranguing them, I mean, giving them a piece of their mind? Do you know? Well, we we, I mean, the the lo lobbying is a kind of complicated thing. Okay, first of all, we know that CJA it has uh, far more. Uh, lobbying official lobbying visits than any pro-Palestinian group. The, the individual who is in charge of the Israel-Palestine file in the prime minister's office is a apartheid campaigner. Okay, I wrote a story about him uh, two months ago, three months ago. Um, he went through the uh, uh, the JPAC, uh, the uh, Jewish Public Affairs Committee. Um, um, intern process. Uh, I believe I, I can't remember the details on him, but he he like what he was part of a, a birthright trip to Israel and stuff like that. He or went to one of the maybe did he go to the high maybe he went to uh, Tannenbaum Chat the high school the Jewish high school that has IDF days. So so the guy in charge in the PMO's office of the file is like you know it's not <laughs> he's not. Um, uh, somebody who cares about Palestinians, and you know, I when I looked into him, the the person, he, the group he met with the most, the lobbying visits was Sija, right? So, so you have this pro-Israel guy in charge of the, the file in the PMO office, who that never met with CJPME, never met with Independent Jewish Voices, never met with, according to at least official lobbying registry. I can't, you know, maybe he did some whatever, right? But the official lobbying read. Re uh, uh, registry and he's he's being CJ had like you know 10 visits or eight visits or whatever it was six visits over about a year and a half span so that's that's the, that's the thing and and then but but lobbying also only contrary to uh sometimes I think how people perceive it it's just like a it's an add-on right like if you have the media uh behind you if you have you know, powerful individuals, if you have think tanks, if you have, then going and lobbying is often successful. But if you're like, you know, if you're, you know, a countervailing force, like we are, right, the people who are, you know, then lobbying does, you know, it, I'm not saying not to do it, but I'm saying it doesn't generally have much effect. Um, so, you know, Trudeau, right, again, like his, his main uh, fundraiser, uh, Stephen Bronfman, Back in 2013, stated really explicitly in the Globe Mail that Israel was central to why he was taking charge of the Trudeau's fundraising campaign for to become prime minister and lead the Liberal Party 
and he's a long-standing anti-Palestinian, you know, family that ran ran guns to the Zionist forces in 1948. His, you know, his his grandfather. Um, so so if you just got it, you go through the whole kind of process, uh, you know, all the different pieces, right? The media is 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 dominated by uh, uh, anti-Palestinian voices. So I, I believe I don't know the numbers, right? I think most of the Jewish community in Canada is pro-Zionist, but there's at least, you know, there would be 10% that's like anti-Zionist and then 10 or 20% more who, who are very uncomfortable with what Israel does. And right. And like all those Jewish voices are just ignored in, in, from, from Trudeau, right? Like the, it, it's, it, it's a prioritization of, of, the you know pro-Israel, pro-Zionist, pro-genocide, whatever exactly you want to call it, and you know there's there's thousands and thousands of Canadian Jews who know that over the past uh, three and a half months, you know they go about their lives just as they've been going about their lives. Yes, there are, there is. I think we should be clear there has been an uptick in in hate uh, crimes uh, targeting uh, Jews. It's I wouldn't say it's irrelevant, but it's a very little um, uh, consequence in most Canadian Jews' uh, lives, and it's irrelevant compared to the horrors of of what's going on in Gaza. Um, but that's so- why I think, that's why I think I think I think I think I think you're underestimating what we could do. I think that we that there are there are. I mean, I know from my experience with Citizens Climate Lobby, uh, we got a carbon price because of that, because we lobbied and lobbied and lobbied Catherine McKenna. And I think, I think, I think we're, we're, we may be failing the system by not organizing peace lobbies and, and you know, just, just really building up a very strong, angry community that is really upset with what's happened. For sure, but but we're doing that by having these demonstrations. I mean, sixteen weeks in a row in Montreal, there's been over a thousand people. That the high, the highest one was fifty thousand taking to the streets. Um, so so the the specific element of lobbying. I don't. I'm not arguing against lobbying. I don't, I think there is a role yeah. in in having you know formal registered organization. It's not the type of politics I want to participate in. Um, but I don't. I don't. I think it does play a function in in um in in you know change social change but i i think that we're we'd be uh mistaken to uh emphasize that piece within the overarching um political campaigning uh dynamic that 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 um that uh that we should be doing justin trudeau is not ignorant <laughs> of what is going on they all know what's going on they all know that like their horrors was happening in gaza they all know the different ways that canada is supporting israel they all know that they, they it's not like they've heard this like they heard it today at in front of the queen elizabeth where people are protesting you know 20 of us or whatever it was you know about palestine their staffers were aware of us being there the police were aware of us being there they're aware there was a demonstration the day before where they were you know like they're aware of all the all the basics um so it's, it's not a it's not a communication issue it's a it's a uh, power building issue and and at this point um again i i i support uh efforts to uh lobby or to go and talk to and to these ministers or prime minister's office or all this kind of stuff but we shouldn't be like naive to think that there is a power structure on this issue specifically on foreign policy more generally but on this issue specifically that makes it very difficult to uh crack it via like you know nice lobbying um, versus- I, wasn't, I wasn't suggesting that we'd, we'd be nice. I, I, I know I know there's a certain protocol you have to follow when you lobby. I'm just suggesting that somehow there's the connection is not being made. He's listening to the Jewish voices who are afraid, but he's not listening to us. 
but he, but I don't I, I don't I think he's listening. He's he's even if you even break it even minus you know the ninety nine percent of Canadians who are not Jewish. But even within the Jewish community, he is choosing to listen to a certain perspective within the Jewish community. He's not interested in having independent Jewish voices. Uh, you know, he, he he met with these these uh, these rabbis, uh, but just before the the I, I listed what he said um, in Toronto, uh, just before the South Africa case, uh, so ten days ago, whatever. He doesn't want to meet with Rabbi David Miviser, right? He doesn't want to meet with independent Jewish voices. And his staff or his guy in charge of the the file in the PMO doesn't want to meet with those groups either, right? Like they're, it, 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 it's it's they, they're they're choosing what the what the perspective and that perspective is intertwined with the U.S. Empire and it's intertwined with all kinds of like you know his fundraisers what they want and uh, you know Bronfen family whatever. So it's intertwined with like uh, the media sphere. I mean, if you read the major media, if you read the National Post. You read the Sun Media. I don't read the Sun Media, but I read the National Post, uh, you know, daily. Uh, you would think that Israel is the victim here, and and uh, and uh, you know the Palestine. And so this is this is our media sphere, and so that's where you know that explains what voices uh, Trudeau is interested in listening to, and what voices he's not interested in listening to. And um, it's not yeah. fair. It's not fair by any means. No. So it's uh, it's already seven sixteen. Um, so uh, if there's no more questions, I thank everyone for um, uh, um, uh, participating. Uh, same time, uh, uh, same uh, same place next week. Take care, everyone. Thank you.